Hello from Ottawa. I'm very happy today to be able to speak to you about IFLA LRM. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to switch over to share screen so that we can all see the slides at the same time. So as you know, IFLA LRM was approved by, uh, by IFLA, became an official IFLA standard in August 2017, and you can find the full definition of the standard at the IFLA website under current IFLA standards. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about the cons process of consolidating the three models. What does this entail? I'm going to talk about some of the major changes and why these changes are useful to know about um, and helps us understand when we see these changes applied in applications, applications such as RDA. So we're going to look at some very simple uh, differences between the models, such as levels of granularity, and we're also going to touch upon the aggregates debate, all the way up to and including touching on the aggregates debate. As we all know, IFLA LRM is a high-level conceptual model. In uh, LRM 2.1, we see the statement, the model seeks to reveal the commonalities and the underlying structure of bibliographic resources. So what does this mean? It's basically to provide a framework for a shared understanding about the nature of bibliographic information. How does bibliographic information fit together? But it also is so that we share this understanding around the world. So as an IFLA standard, and that's why it's important that LRM is an IFLA standard, it expresses international agreement about the structure of bibliographic information. Now, IFLA LRM is very abstract, and it acts as a starting point, a starting point for real-life applications, for data models that then further refine and extend the model. It lays the groundwork for data interoperability because surface descriptive traditions and practices may differ, but if we all share the same underlying understanding of the structure of bibliographic information, it means our data can interoperate. It's a starting point for the design of cataloging codes. And because IFLA LRM was developed 20 years after FRBR, it is designed with an awareness of emerging and uh, emerging technological environments. And so it's optimized both for current and emerging technologies such as linked data. So we all know that IFLA LRM is the consolidation of the three previous IFLA bibliographic conceptual models, FRBR, FRAD, and FRSAD for bibliographic authority and subject authority data. But IFLA LRM is not a break with the past. In the words of Pat Riva, who um, in her Lexio Magistralis said, LRM is evolutionary, not disruptive. So that means that LRM is basically staying true to all the underlying concepts, framework, and logic of the three previous FR models. So one of the first things, of course, when we look at LRM, we see that at the core of LRM are the entities work, expression, manifestation, and item, just as they are in the other models. However, it's important to remember that in the beginning, there was just one model. So FRBR is published in 1998, and it has a tremendous impact. People get very excited about it. They talk about the explanatory power of the model. It makes so much sense. They apply it in projects. People are writing about it, discussing, critiquing it, holding seminars and conferences. So it causes a big buzz. One of the effects is, of course, is that IFLA is listening to this and sees that FRBR has, is making a difference and so s creates two more working groups. One working group that is looking at authority data and the other one at subject authority data. And these two groups produce models in 2009 and 2011. So we have one original model, FRBR, and two extensions of FRBR, FRAD and FRASAD. That means three entity relationship models. Now they're closely related and we speak of them as the family of FRBR conceptual models, but we have to remember they were developed separately by different groups of people. So 
the models are not entirely consistent with each other. Now, in the library community, usually you're trying to apply all three models together because you need all three aspects. However, what do you do when you, if you want to try to integrate these models into one application? And especially, what do you do if there's a contradiction between the models? Because there's no guidance on what you should do in those kind of cases. And you end up with individual applications and implementations coming up with their own interpretations, and you have this ad hoc resolution of contradictions which breaks the idea of a shared framework and shared understanding. So IFLA recognized that this was very important, and the minute that FRSAD was published in 2011 said about the process of consolidation. Now consolidation is not a mix and match exercise. Consolidation recognizes the importance of the three models, and so the underlying philosophy of the models is kept. But everything had to be examined and reevaluated. User tasks, entities, attributes, relationships, their scope, their definitions, how they fit in. Now just think of something really simple like the user task to find a nice uncontroversial user task. However, each model has a different definition. So you can't just pick one of the definitions and use it. You have to actually look at all three definitions and try to figure out a new definition that captures the essence of the three uh, definitions that now exist. And so that's what I mean about everything had to be reevaluated. Now, the consolidation process also learns from experience. They start, of course, with the three original models, but then also used what was had been learned from experiences and feedback from the community, from people who had applied the original three models. So from those who were designing databases and applications, for those who, do, who were developing cataloging standards, or those who were writing from theoretical perspectives. Another area of very important information came from the experience of modeling FRBR 00, which is the object-oriented version of FRBR. FRBR 00 version 1 was only the object-oriented version of FRBR. But FRBR 2.4 is the object-oriented version of the three entity relationship models, for Frad and for SAD. And so there was a lot of interesting things that were learned uh, during that process. The consolidation process also incorporated new research observations and experiences. And so, for example, the LRM representative expression attribute, it stems out of research on end user perceptions about expression. There has also been a lot of research and debates on aggregates and the consolidation, um, the consolidation process integrated uh, the reports of the aggregates uh, working group as well. Now, when we look at the three models and you consider consolidating, one of the first things that strikes you, of course, is the different levels of granularity. And now this is one of the most obvious um, disparities in uh, granularity, uh, but illustrates the problem. So for the subject entities, FRBR, we have the original group three entities, concept, object, event, and place. But FRBR then states that all the bibliographic entities can, in fact, be subjects. So we have 10 subject entities. We look at Frasad, there's one subject entity, Tema. So you can see that the issue of granularity, if you're bringing three together, you have to achieve a consistent granularity throughout the model. Then there are the contradictions. Now, if you look at Ferber and Frad, they have two different definitions of person. In Ferber, a person is an individual, a real individual, living or dead. In Frad, the definition is expanded, so it's a person, or a persona, or an identity established or adopted by an individual or a group of individuals. And it also can include fictitious characters, legendary characters, biblical characters, etc. If the LRM had a real issue having to think about what they were going to do to resolve this contradiction, if the LRM also looked at the modeling in other cultural heritage communities because you want your model to be able to 
interoperate with the models of other communities. And so the definition of person as an individual human being was more consistent with what was happening in other communities. And as well, there were different ways to achieve um, to achieve a, a recording sufficient information about fictitious characters, etc., by modeling uh, from different ways of modeling. And so, IFLA LRM went with the definition, which is much closer to the FRBR definition of person. Now, this is a perfect example of what happens if when the models are inconsistent and somebody's developing a real application such as RDA. So RDA had to make a decision. Which definition of person were they going to take? The Ferber one or the FRAD one? And they went with the FRAD one. Now, LRM has said that this is the definition of person, a real individual, and RDA to maintain its consistency and alignment with an internationally accepted bibliographic conceptual model must change its definition of person to align with LRM. We see also contradictions in the way certain things were modeled. When we look at name in FRBR, it's an attribute. It's an attribute of several entities, such as person or corporate body. When we look at FRAD, name becomes an entity in its own right. And this entity name can have relationships with other entities, such as a person or a corporate body, etc. And when we look at FRAD, it continues this idea of entity in its own right, but it's a broader entity called nomen. And nomen includes name, controlled access point, and identifier. So again, we look at an application like RDA, RDA had to choose how it was going to treat name. And RDA chose to treat name as an attribute. So we did not have the entity name or nomen in RDA until 2018, because with LRM, nomen is an entity uh, as a, and, an, and an important entity in terms of how you're going to deal with things uh, issues like fictitious characters and personas. So it was very important that RDA add nomen as an entity, and that's why we see it now in, uh, in the new uh, version. Um, LRM was also um, very conscious of technological environments because, of course, we work in automated environments. We do not work simply with paper and pencil. And um, therefore, the three original models, when they were written, they were written as discursive texts. They were written solely for humans to read and appreciate and understand. However, there was an understanding that if the LRM would be read and understood by humans, but would also need to transition to namespace so it could be used by computers in a linked data environment. And so therefore, it was organized and formatted for this transition to namespaces. That's why you see that every single entity, attribute, and relationship has a unique ID. And then, of course, it's presented with the name, the definition, the constraints, as well as the scope notes and examples. Another thing that was introduced for the current technological environment was modeling, the hierarchical modeling with superclasses and subclasses. Superclass and subclass is very useful because of its efficiency and it reduces repetition. So any attribute or relationship that you can declare at the superclass level is automatically inherited by every single subclass. That means you do not have to repeat it for every single subclass. You just have it declared once. So it's much more efficient um, for modeling. It is certainly efficient in a document, but it is particularly useful in um, automated environments. Computers respond respond well to the superclass, subclass um, kind of structure. So we see that in Ferber and in FRAD, we had a very flat structure of person, family, and corporate body, three entities all at the same level. 
IFLA LRM introduces the hierarchy of agent, which is the superclass. An agent is subdivided in two subclasses, person and collective agent. As I said, IFLA LRM is high level is a high level model. And it's understood that any entity can be further refined by an application. So RDA maintains person, family, and corporate body. But what it does, it adds in the structure of the superclass subclass. So it introduces superclass, the superclass agent, which is subdivided into person and collective agent, just like an F IFLA LRM, it then takes collective agent and makes that a superclass of family and corporate body. And thus remains in alignment with LRM. Um, LRM also introduces two new entities, place and time span. And place in this case is not place in the sense of a subject, but place in the sense of a space. Now, by introducing these two entities, again, it streamlines modeling because you can move a lot of the attributes over to relationships. And an attribute is a literal. And in a linked data environment, that's a dead end. But a relationship is a potential link. And the linked data environment thrives on relationships. So, Looking at something like data publication, in FRBR, it's an attribute of the manifestation. And it's a literal. That means it's a dead end in a linked data environment. In LRM, by introducing the time span as an entity, it means that an entity such as manifestation can have a relationship of association with the entity time span. Now, IFLA LRM, again, stays at a high level and simply states a relationship of manifestation association associated with time span. But an implementation, such as RDA, can further define this relationship and say the relationship is the relationship of is date of publication. Manifestation statement is a new attribute of the manifestation. It sort of represents everything that we're used to transcribing because it is the sum total of all the statements that appear on exemplars. And as LRM states, these, this statement is significant for users to understand how the resource represents itself. Now, if the LRM does not say how you should break down manifestation statement, it simply indicates the place within the model where it belongs. It does not tell you how you're going to record it. It remains totally non-prescriptive. Then an application or implementation such as RDA, such as ISBD, can give instructions on how to, how to record this manifestation statement, what kind of subtypes you're going to use within this manifestation statement. <clears throat> now, by doing this, then LRM maintains this non-prescriptive stance, which means that it's also uh, a model that can be used by different communities, not just different communities around the globe, but potentially also by other cult cultural heritage communities who can then see, okay, you know, the library community puts a certain amount of importance on this manifestation statement, and if they wanted to follow, they could, but they would not have to use library specific uh, breakdown of how the manifestation statement is recorded. Another interesting new attribute is representative expression. And as I mentioned before, it comes out of end user feedback uh, about expression and um, also developmental work with FRBROO. And it's basically that in terms of users, users don't see all expressions as being the same. They see some expressions as being more representative of the work than others. So I always go back to Hamlet as my example. So Hamlet in the original Elizabethan English text as a play is seen as more representative of Hamlet than an abridgment of Hamlet or than um, a French translation of Hamlet. But in terms of modeling, all expressions of a work are equal. And that is maintained 
But this attribute allows one to record values that are associated with a representative or canonical expression, which can then be used, for example, to push representative expressions, let's say, to the top of a display for users. So it's an attribute that is in response to being able to fulfill user tasks, particularly. By having the representative expression attribute, you introduce a place in the model where you can record this kind of data. You're acknowledging what users feel is important to them, which is the represented, knowing which is the rep most representative expression. Also catalogers, we tend to choose a preferred title for a work from a representative expression. And so it's a pragmatic place to park information and it's parked with the work even though they are expression attributes. Now, the, again, the representative expression attribute is just there and then an individual is there, it's introduced, but then an individual implementation or application can subtype, subtype it according to their needs of their domain or their user group and audience. Aggregates, a big empty place in FRBR. It, FRBR was totally silent on aggregates. And in recognition of this, the FRBR review group in 2005 set up the working group on aggregates. The report was issued in 2011, which was about the same time that work on consolidation was beginning. And it was understood that the, the recommendations of the aggregates working report would be incorporated in the consolidation uh, process. It's a major step forward in modeling. And there are, I think, to me, these are the two key aspects. One is the recognition that an aggregate is a manifestation embodying multiple expressions. And the second part is that there is something called the aggregating work and the aggregating expression. Yes, they do exist, but they're not the sum of expressions. They are plans. So let's just look at the diagram from, F, uh, from L, uh, IFLA LRM. And let's say my aggregate manifestation is an anthology. So my anthology is of short stories, 10 short stories. So my aggregate manifestation embodies 10 short stories, 10 expressions are embodied in my aggregate manifestation. But my aggregate manifestation also embodies a plan because a group of editors got together and say, okay, we want the 10 best short stories um, published, let's say in 2015. And we are going to choose them according to these criteria and and they go ahead and do this work. So there is there a plan, and that plan is the aggregating work, which is realized through the aggregating expression, which is then embodying in the aggregate manifestation. So the aggregate manifestation sort of is embodying two different streams. One is the expressions of the individual pieces that are in the aggregate, and it's also embodying the plan. So this modeling helps, gives us a better understanding of what aggregates are all about. It doesn't mean you always have to record the aggregating work and expression, the plan. There may at times be instances where it's important and significant and you can record it, but the thing is you can also record it later. So at the time that you're actually doing your description, you may not record it. But it's very important because an area where there was a lot of confusion was in the differentiation between the whole part relationship and the aggregating relationship. And this modeling makes it very clear that they are not related at all. So for example, Act 3 of Hamlet is a part of Hamlet. And it is always a part of Hamlet, no matter which expression or which manifestation, we always see that work relationship of whole part. So whole part is a, is a relationship 
that is happening only at the work and it holds true for all expressions and all manifestations. Whereas the aggregating one is very different because for example, let's take the short story, Happy Prince. Happy Prince can be aggregated in my anthology of 10 best short stories. It can be aggregated in another manifestation, which is 10 best children's stories. It can be aggregated in another manifestation, 10 best British short stories. It remains the same work that is, rep that is in that one um, particular expression. That same expression could be in all three of these aggregate manifestations. That doesn't change. But those aggregate manifestations change. So it's a different kind of relationship. So it makes it a little bit easier to start getting our heads around aggregates by having this new uh, modeling for us. One of the things LRM adds as well is looking at the types of aggregates. It talks about aggregates as collections of expressions, such as the one I was giving you, a collection of short stories or poems, a compilation of a CD. Or, for example, a journal issue, which is a collection of individual articles. Each of those articles is its own expression. An aggregate also results from augmentation, such as when there's a main work, which is supplemented, let's say, with illustrations, or maybe with an introduction and notes. Or parallel expressions in one uh, aggregate manifestation. For example, when we have uh, many, often with uh, the classics from the uh, from Greek uh, Greek and Latin um, are presented in Greek or Latin on one page and English on the other page. We have bilingual government documents. We have DVDs which have expressions in many different languages. So, by helping us understand and group together and sort out aggregates, it's hoped that LRM is also, you know, illuminating the way forward with how we treat aggregates uh, as we catalog as well. And then there's how this modeling of aggregates affects serials, which Ed Jones is going to look at, uh, which is extremely interesting um, as well. So IFLA LRM, the impact of IFLA LRM is that we now have one model instead of three. So it's a lot easier to apply. One of the important things to remember is that IFLA LRM also supersedes the three previous models, which means that the moment it was published, Ferber, Frad, and Frasad became obsolete. But that doesn't mean that Ferber, Frad, and Frasad really disappear because IFLA LRM carries forward the essence of those three previous models. However, if you have designed an application or an implementation based on the three previous models, one may need to make adjustments, especially in areas where there were contradictions. And that's certainly what we see with RDA. The other thing about IFLA LRM, because it was designed, developed, designed and developed at this particular time, it is also optimized for the current and emerging technological environments, um, and specifically for the linked data environment. So I thank you very much. Um, and I encourage you to feel free to email me with questions, because since I'm not in the room, it does make it a little bit difficult. But this has been a wonderful opportunity um, to share about IFLA LRM. And um, I will now say, um, oops, stop sharing screen. <laughs> I will now say goodbye from Ottawa and enjoy the rest of the conference.